рад, когда у меня есть возможность посетить Москву. Хотя последний раз, по-моему, я здесь был 20 лет назад, и тогда я прилетел в Москву, в столицу СССР. Это, это изменилось. Что же я не знаю. Окей, okay, so let me switch to, uh, to uh, some mathematics. So I am going to talk about uh, some very old problems. <coughs> Most of them go back to Paul Erdős. And I should mention that at the time Erdős came up with this problem, they, they looked absolutely aggravated problems. So most people uh, who uh, solved those problems, they thought that they were silly problems. They probably belonged to uh, sort of recreational journals rather than uh, to serious mathematics. And this may be the truth. However, we were very lucky uh, because, uh, first of all, it turned out just by accident that, uh, that uh, these problems uh, uh, were instrumental in the development of extremal combinatorics. And extremal combinatorics, if you were lucky again, turned out to be very useful in uh, theoretical computer science, if there is such a thing. And uh, on a completely different uh, sort of plane, uh, these questions are geometric questions asked by Erdős. Uh, they also turned out to be important in geometric algorithms. Now, geometric algorithms kind of more directly have something to do with, uh, with practice because uh, uh, there is a need uh, from the side of the industry for uh, computer graphics and things like that. And uh, the computer graphics and, and uh, 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 robotics are very precious that, uh, that have a similar flavor. Now, those questions uh, kind of uh, uh, motivated a lot of research in combinatorial geometry. And uh, mostly computer scientists, computational geometers, solved several questions of those. Unfortunately, by that time, computer scientists and people working in robotics and graphics solved those problems in a completely different ma manner, uh, without using those clever mathematical methods and mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that's good. I think we should be happy. So this is Paul Erdős. Uh, 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 those questions, and it's not very bad if you go, but uh, you should believe me, uh, I actually <laughs> studied this picture, and, uh, and in the background, there are some formulas in the, on, the, on the whiteboard that are uh, exactly the formulas involved in this question that uh, I like to uh, talk about. This, this picture was taken in high form. Years. So, uh, in 1946, Erdős published a paper, or, or I'm not sure it was a paper, it appeared in the problem section, uh, section of the American Mathematical uh, Monthly. It was two, three pages long, uh, in which uh, he asked two questions, uh, and, and then he added that. Uh, felt kind of bad that, uh, uh, that he made so little progress uh, about these questions, despite the fact that he had been working on them for years. So the first question was the following. I, I am talking about case D plus 1, uh, about the uh, case uh, plane. Assume we are taking n points in the plane, uh, and we, we are allowed to arrange them in any way we wish. Uh, and our goal is to maximize the number of pairs that are at unit distance from each other. So how many times can the unit distance occur at most? In fact, it takes some time uh, to realize that uh, it can be super linear. But it can. I mean, linear is trivial because you can, 
you can take uh, the integer trip, square root m by square root n. And then if these are the points and points, and if you take any point, then there are four points at unit distance from it, so you have uh, roughly two at unit distance. Of course, you would realize that if instead of the integer, if you take the triangular lattice, then the two n becomes three n. Uh, but what is even more interesting, that if you don't choose the unit distance to be this distance, but for instance, you choose the this unit distance to be this distance, <coughs> Uh, or some, or the most popular distance, as a matter of fact, then you get slightly superior. How slightly? Well, n to the 1 plus uh, uh, constant divided by log. Really very slightly. Uh, and uh, Edwish conjectures that that was your. From the other side, uh, he could prove for the n to the 3 half, but that was uh, one of the early applications uh, and in fact, in number theory, there were earlier ones, but early applications in geometry of the, of the uh, extremal graph theory method, because it turns out that if you join two points by an edge, if their distance is one, then you get a graph, we call it a unit distance graph, and this graph does not contain a k to 3. The complete graph is two vertices in one, uh, plus at three. Uh, this, this is uh, obvious uh, geometry because two unit circles can intersect only two points and not this. And from this fact alone, it follows that the number of uh, unit distances is the most interesting. So that was what Erdős noticed. And now, let me see, almost uh, 70 years later, uh, where we we cannot show much improvement. Instead of three half, now we have n to the fourth third. Now, for this n to the fourth third, we have several different proofs. And curiously enough, all of them stop at n to the fourth third. No one knows why. Perhaps because that's the truth. And uh, the strange thing is that that's definitely the truth for some other very simple methods. But probably not for the but we cannot be sure. So definitely for the Euclidean one, what we do conjecture is that uh, the answer is uh, the n to the 1 plus epsilon, the upper one, which is then smaller than n to the 1 plus epsilon for any epsilon. So uh, this question uh, in three dimensions, it's even more complicated. But again, uh, extremal graph theory comes to the rescue. Uh, if we step up to higher dimensions, and actually, in, uh, starting from, from uh, four dimensions, the truth is uh, And that was uh, also the, uh, the proof by Edwish, you know, the asymptotic answer. Uh, in four dimensions, uh, uh, the construction is a quadratic number of unit distances is a simple construction, which is due to lens. I don't know how to draw a picture in four dimensions, but I try. Uh, so you take two uh, uh, unit circles uh, in uh, perpendicular planes in four dimensions, four dimensions, and you take L half points here, and L half points there. Then any two points uh, so, so these two circles are concentric. And any two points that are on different circles, that is then you can square two because of the uh, uh, Pythagorean theory. And you just call this distance square to two part. And then you've got uh, n squared divided by four distances. And again, by a single graph, so you can see that this is the S. Now, <coughs> the second problem that Erdős asked it's kind of dual to me. Uh, this is called the uh, distinct distances problem. And that was supposed to be a little bit easier. So uh, again, in the plane, uh, what we are interested in is that we take n points, and we would like to see that at least how many distinct distances is correct. Right? And clearly, there is a relationship between the two problems. 
because if you know that the same distance cannot occur too many times, altogether there are angles two distances, so there must be at least a certain number of distances. Some says you can say that uh, this is weaker. Again, if you look at the grid, then it will give n divided by square root log n distinct distances, and for if you wish, uh, semi-religious reasons, uh, we conjecture that that's the truth. I say semi-religious reasons because there are very few uh, symmetric constructions that we know in the plane that are substantially different from a grid or a projection of a higher dimensional grid. And in this problem, there was sort of gradual progress. Uh, uh, so I think that Moser first took uh, and the two thirds from below, uh, and then uh, back he proved it a little bit, and then Chang and Semering and Trotter proved and to the four thirds, maybe apart from a logarithmic factor, which was removed by Staker, and then there was kind of a mini breakthrough by uh, Shoimoshi and Chapatot, uh, who further improved uh, by a completely different mass of the exponent. Uh, yeah, using kind of topological graphs. <coughs> and uh, and uh, this was perfected by Quatz uh, and Tarzos, who gave the uh, lower bound shown there. I'm using the big omega notation from computer science, meaning that at least constant times and uh, 0 0.86. Uh, and then, uh, the big breakthrough uh, came a couple of years ago, the paper is still not published, uh, by Good and Katz. Good example of applied mathematics because uh, both Good and Katz got uh, very good positions after uh, proving this theorem, uh, even before the official publication. But this was really quite a big so they proved Adders, uh, Adders conjecture uh, up to uh, square root loss. Uh, and there is another interesting thing concerning this uh, proof, namely, uh, the proof preceded by the ideas of Alakash, uh, the late uh, Jörg Alakash, uh, who set up kind of a scheme for uh, for uh, uh, attacking this problem, uh, which was posthumously uh, published uh, in a joint paper with uh, Niha Shahir. Uh, and that plan consisted of three steps. And actually, two out of those three steps, uh, uh, at least two, were complete nonsense. There was absolutely no reason to believe that uh, they would be true, apart from the fact that uh, uh, they would provide sort of a royal way to uh, this antibody dialogue. And what Hood and Katz did, in fact, was that they proved that each of these three steps that are like a so they proved each of uh, uh, these projects, which was uh, uh, quite amazing. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, anyone who was, who was working on this problem should be jealous about such an elegant uh, uh, approach, and especially uh, that uh, they had the sort of, uh, they really trusted Alakash's uh, in, 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 in this matter. So I should also add something negative about that. So the negative thing, apart from the little square root of, square root log and mistake is, that all other results, including the lower bound up there, uh, really prove something strong. Namely, they don't, don't just prove that among the endpoints in the plane, there are at least this many distinct distances, but they also prove that there is a single point from which at least this many distinct distances occur. And uh, Alakash and consequently uh, Wood and Katz uh, lose this nice property uh, in the very first time. Now this may well be a technicality, and I think that this is a good problem to, to try.
try to work on it to uh, 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 try to translate uh, these methods uh, to give a uh, to give a, the same lower bound, hopefully the same lower bound, uh, or at least to improve the cut establishment or the number of distinct distances from a single. In higher dimensions, uh, again, uh, the, as, as the dimension goes up, uh, due to work of Shoy Moshi and Wu, uh, the situation is uh, not bad that we are approaching uh, the upper bound uh, due to So uh, let me uh, use this opportunity to uh, call attention to two kind of forgotten conjectures of all efforts which are related to, the, uh, to this problem. So, uh, obviously, the minimum number of distinct distances uh, is uh, uh, at most quadratic. Uh, but there are not too many examples where we can go below linear, or there are not too many examples, in fact, where the number of distinct distances is, is uh, just linear. So here, of course, we know that it is slightly sublinear uh, for the grid. Then you look at the middle example, the, the, the regular angle, then you have exactly half, half, it's exactly the same from each point, so you have like and half distinct distances, and what else? We kind of run out of uh, run out of examples where we are close to n. So, uh, of course, uh, both of those examples are, are very symmetric. So, in particular, they contain a huge number of isosceles triangles, and uh, uh, average conjecture. Uh, that if you exclude as all see these triangles, then the number of distinct distances will grow superficially. This may be a, a, an attackable problem. Actually, it may be so by, by uh, completely different methods. And towards the other end of the scale, the, scale, the quadratic, uh, uh, this I don't want to uh, go into. Uh, motivation of this conjecture by Edwards, but uh, it's not a completely unmotivated conjecture, which, has, which is connected to interesting questions of combinatory, that if you assume that uh, every uh, four to two of points determine at least uh, uh, five distinct distances, which excludes all kinds of uh, uh, trivial symmetric constructions, then the number of uh, distinct distances as big as can quadratic. Or close to quadratic. If you can prove as that divided by Logan, then. What is it? What is it? What power? It's a good question. I don't know. Similarly, so, there's something about the first part. Similarly, we have something about the first part. And uh, so we have uh, 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 M 
points on one line, and points on the other. How many distinct distances are uh, between these points? And even if we put points on one line red, points on other line blue, perhaps red blue distances uh, must be very large. This is the point that unless these two lines are in some special position, the number of uh, such distances must be very large. And in fact, it must be uh, probably close to a strength. <laughs> but we don't know, even in that, even in that special case. So uh, there are two obvious exceptions. One obvious exception is when the blue points and the red points are on two parallel lines, kind of empty distance from each other, then obviously uh, this construction, you don't see the blue and the red, I don't see either, but uh, 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 this looks more or less the same from every point, so you have uh, roughly n uh, distinct distance. Uh, but there is another slightly more difficult example when the two lines are perpendicular to each other, then if you take the points of the uh, whose coordinates are the square roots of the uh, integers, then again the number of distinct distances between them, the red and blue points, may be only linear, because if you take a point in the red set, a point in the blue set, then uh, the distance will be square root of i squared plus square root of j squared squared. So the conjecture is that it jumps. If, if you exclude orthogonal or parallel lines, then it jumps. And in fact, Erekes and Brunyai uh, already in the uh, year uh, 2000 proved uh, that uh, if BD jumps, the exponent jumps, jumps by a positive epsilon. And uh, Erekes improved it right here earlier. Uh, Five quarters by specializing that. Uh, now, uh, there was a further improvement by Charlie Schaeffer and Choi Moshi uh, last year that uh, led to the five quarter improvement by four thirds. But of course, the big answer of the question is whether it is close to n squared divided by log n. And what is n squared divided by log n? n squared divided by log n is uh, if you take uh, two lines, uh, this, uh, this is 60 degrees, and you take the integral points of this line, the integral points of that. That behaves just like uh, the green, except that it has much fewer points, because what is, uh, what is square root n here becomes n there. That's why in the formula you get n squared rather than So that, that would be the the conjecture, but we are, as you see, very far. So what I'd like to uh, report here, and maybe uh, say a couple of words about, uh, uh, not much because it becomes uh, quite technical, is uh, an extension of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Schaeffer, uh, Shoy Moshi, uh, Shari result, uh, to algebraic curves. So uh, we take an algebraic curve of a fixed degree in the plane and uh, we take n points on that. Uh, and uh, the question is that how many distinct distances are among these n points? And uh, what we prove that unless the points, uh, uh, unless the algebraic curve contains a line or it contains a circle, which are obviously uh, two cases, two cases to exclude, the number of distinct distances will be distinct. So the same bound that's uh, uh, proved by, by uh, uh, Schaeffer and Potter. Now, uh, the proof is really bipartite, uh, just like uh, in that case. Uh, so we take two curves, and in fact, uh, uh, it is enough to consider irreducible uh, algebraic curves. We have to see that we think of P as a fixed number. It doesn't really matter uh, how big it will be. 
and uh, we assume that these two curves are uh, are uh, uh, not uh, orthogonal lines or not concentric sets. So, so this is one of the curves, C1, and you take another curve, C2. You assume that they are irreducible, that degree is B. And uh, you take M points, uh, as we know that like P are the front of the curve, so I go from 1 to M, and I take uh, M, M points. And we only consider the distances between points. And uh, we will know that the number of these distances between them is at least n to the two thirds times n to the two thirds. And indeed, when m and m become equal, then uh, it gives the n to the fourth uh, uh, bound. But you always see those uh, ugly things that uh, m squared and n squared, they are there just to avoid trivialities. So that if on one curve you have much more than on the other, then uh, just give some 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 trivia. So how do we approach this problem? In fact, the truth is that uh, that uh, uh, I only know uh, one approach to problems of this kind, uh, which uh, uses uh, some elementary algebraic geometry and some elementary combinatorial. And then uh, modulo ugly technical details uh, sort of one can explain uh, how to do it. Okay. So I should mention here that uh, uh, exactly the same result uh, with a somewhat worse exponent instead of n to the fourth or n to the five quarters was proved by Haralan Vides, uh, a PhD student in uh, Berkeley uh, who used a completely different uh, analytic method, but still uh, uh, my statement is true because I don't understand the details of it. Because it uses some heavy analytical machinery that uh, I believe, but uh, I don't know no real understanding of it. OK. So what are the tools? The tools, so I will simplify that completely. Uh, uh, for the sake of this presentation, because I want to avoid technicalities, but uh, so I will just say that I am using Bezos inequality. So Bezos inequality we learned in school, it just means that if you have uh, two algebraic curves, uh, then either they share a common component, or if not, then you can count them at most how many points they have in common, at most d one times d two, and uh, this is. Uh, some sense type, but I don't want to go into that. And this statement uh, has all kinds of generalizations. Uh, uh, and the one we actually use uh, is uh, more about, uh, it's, it's, it's often called the uh, communal uh, theorem, uh, which says something about the uh, 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 its simplest form about the number of connected components. <coughs> but uh, if you allow me to lie a little bit, then we can call it this. Now the second statement uh, is uh, a technical statement, uh, which uh, uh, you don't have to uh, look at the formulas too much. Uh, if you trust me, of course, why should I be trusted? Uh, but um, uh, this is uh, so. So the problem is that uh, that you have a, a bunch of curves in the plane and a bunch of points. When a curve happens to pass through a point, then you call it an uh, And uh, assume that uh, your system of uh, uh, curves is simple in the sense that any two curves have only a bounded number. Points in time. That bound I denote it by S. Again, it doesn't matter what that number is, 
it's important only that there is such a number. It is 10 to the 10th of the electric inductor, but usually it is. And then for this family of curves, we say that they have k degrees of freedom if uh, through any k points there are at most a constant number of curves passing from your path. So again, the constant, I can call it the same. So uh, for instance, uh, the degree of freedom of the family of lines, right, is uh, 2. Because if you take two points, then there is only one line. If you look at unit circles, for instance, unit circles, then again, if you take two points, then there are only a constant number, two unit circles passing. So the, the, the degree of freedom is two. If you look at all circles, forget about the unit, then the degree of freedom is uh, three. Because if you, if you take uh, uh, three points, then there is only one set. It's not a natural notion. And under these circumstances, there is a simple lemma, uh, which for, for some curious reason is named after Charlie Lemmer staff. Uh, and uh, uh, it gives a formula that if you fix this number k, uh, and uh, you have a set of points P and a set of curves gamma with k degrees of freedom, then uh, the number of incidences uh, among them uh, is uh, bounded from it. Now, uh, the exponents uh, uh, depend on k, and uh, of course the trivial bound would be uh, P the cardinality of P times the cardinality of K. But this is better. It's a non trivial And these are the, essentially the, the two, uh, two uh, components of it. Now you see the same picture there. Uh, in, no, it's actually a, well, it, it depends. In the beginning it is not very bad, but but, but no one really knows. This is a big answer of question. That's the best we can do, no matter how we go. We can, we can try to prove it by the probabilistic method, we can try to do it by other methods, this part of the we got, and this is a big answer of question. Then we can prove it, and if you can improve it, then you automatically improve a lot of other things. So, uh, so I call the first curve C1, C2, just like here. And uh, uh, if the, uh, the point PI has two coordinates AI and PI, uh, and the point uh, QS has two coordinates X, S, and Y, S, and the choice of letters is intentional because I will think of uh, the points on the second curve uh, as the variable. And now, if I want to, uh, uh, if I want to apply uh, the, this uh, incidence lemma that I showed, then obviously I have to define a set of points, and I have to define a set of curves, and possibly the set, uh, set of curves will have a small uh, degree of freedom. Okay. So what will be my points? My points, uh, my point set uh, uh, will be the following that I fix uh, 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 I fix that uh, I see that there is a different notation there, right? So maybe I should change it that these are the points Q and those are the points P so that uh, there is no confusion here because on that picture uh, uh, that's what, uh, what happens. So the points are uh, pairs of points here. So P, S, and P. These are my points. So P, T also has two coordinates. So this means that the point pairs, uh, they are really orthogos. Uh, X, S, Y, S, uh, X, P, Y, P. 
Uh, and these are points in the four-dimensional space. And I think uh, the set of all of these points. So since here I have uh, n points on the second curve, this means that I was taking uh, n square such points. This, uh, this is my point. You see already uh, that I'm going to lie here, because these points are in four dimensions. The statements I, I showed in the previous uh, uh, slide, they are statements on the plane. So, uh, so why am I allowed to use the, uh, actually, uh, that's a good question. Uh, and the answer is that uh, somehow my, most my points that have the curve set, which lead in four dimensions, but can conveniently project, so, by a generic project, so to speak, on a plane, and then one has to argue on the plane. Uh, unfortunately, even this step, although conceptually it's simple, technically it's not clear. Technically it's not clear how you project uh, a four-dimensional point set into a two-dimensional. Three dimensions it's simple. Two dimensions it's uh, they are better. Okay. And what are the curves? The curves are the following. That uh, for every pair of points here, Q, I, and Q, J, I will define a curve, uh, which I uh, call gamma I, J. So the number of uh, uh, such uh, uh, pairs, number of such curves, uh, will be uh, m squared. So I have m squared points, and I will have m squared curves. And uh, what will be the, uh, the uh, curves I get? So the curves, uh, I tell you uh, the, what, uh, the, 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 the actual meaning, and then you can look at the formula. So the actual meaning is that uh, the curve uh, is, uh, uh, consists of those pairs of points for which the first point uh, is as far from Qi as the second one from P. So this means that uh, this is also uh, written here that uh, that uh, uh, gamma G sort of consists of those points I don't know those four tuples for each. Uh, P prime, I write two points. Uh, let me write it in this way that PS, PS, PT. Uh, for which uh, the distance, uh, this, is a, this is a portable, it looks like a pair, but it's a portable because this has two coordinates and this has two coordinates. Uh, so that the distance of uh, QI to PS is the same as the distance of the QJ to P. This will be the curve. Now, uh, I express that in the middle, this curve, in a much uglier way. Uh, the first thing is the defining equation of C2 was F2, and this means that the first point uh, is on the curve C2, the second point is on the curve uh, C2, that's the second part, and then there is this quadratic equation uh, which will express the exact dyslexic problem. So the degree of this curve, the degree of this curve from my A is uh, at most uh, that the first equation has degree D, the second has degree D, the third has two, so it's uh, two D squared, and it's two D squared, I don't know if I Okay, and, and now let me continue lying. Uh, so, well, okay. So, uh, unfortunately, so I would like to say, even if I like, I'd like to say that if I look at uh, these, this set of points, uh, what is that of points? the set of points, uh, Set 
of points P before time matches let it think about it as it obtained, the set of curves uh, uh, of a given degree. Then I like to say that this family of curves uh, has more degree of it. If I would like to apply the uh, Unfortunately, it is not true, uh, but what is true is uh, that I can delete a small number of exceptional points uh, from my family of curves, gamma, uh, from these curves, a small number I can remove, so that the remaining curves uh, <coughs> behave nicely in the sense that among the remaining curves, any two uh, uh, share only uh, there are only two that share a common point. There are no three that uh, share the same point. So if this is, a, this is true, then uh, uh, what I can do is I can delete my exceptional curves, and I can define a graph uh, on my set of curves, the remaining curves, in which I connect two uh, curves uh, by an edge of the graph, uh, if and only if they really share a common point. Now, uh, because uh, a curve has uh, only capital D, the degree of a curve is only capital D, therefore in this graph the degree of a point will be only capital D. It has only this many components. So uh, this means that I can cover that graph with three plus one covers. Uh, so that no two curves in the same color class uh, will, uh, uh, will uh, share a uh, common component. And then it is very easy to see that uh, any two curves of the same color class intersect and gain my basis still in most uh, least the least way. this way you use Yes. Uh, but unfortunately, I have to use it the other direction because I, I have to. Uh, but, but luckily, the formula that defines this curve, the uh, incidence relation between curves and points, uh, is uh, sort of self dual. So now I can use the same in the other direction. In the other direction, I can also find uh, a, a, a small exceptional set of, uh, uh, set of points. I delete them. Uh, and uh, then I can color the remaining points with a small number of colors so that I partition uh, most of the curves into a small number of colors and most of the points into a small number of classes. And now it becomes true that if I forget about the exceptional curves and I take one class of points uh, and one class of curves, then they nicely behave and the degree of freedom will in fact be only two. And, uh, uh, and then, uh, if I know how to deal, and it's not difficult to deal with the exceptional curves, just by bounding, by mm -hmm. using trivial bounds, then uh, there are B plus one little classes of points, B plus one little classes of curves, uh, and uh, between them, uh, I am using the, the incidence bound, so that's why I have B plus one squared, a multiplier of B plus one squared, and uh, then the number of uh, curves uh, uh, will be m squared, that's why I put m squared there, the number of points will be n squared, that's why I put n squared in the formula, and then uh, we get uh, uh, this uh, upper one. Of course, as I said, we have to deal with the exceptional curves, but that's it. Uh, and, uh, thank you. Uh, and then uh, we have, uh, uh, so what we have to count is the, the number of incidences uh, uh, between uh, points and curves. And uh, the number of incidences is the same as the number of, as, as the cardinality of the set Q. So what is this set Q there? The set Q is that I, I am taking uh, the point pairs uh, uh, QI, PS, QJ, PT, so that uh, the distance of, of the 
the Qi from P as the QJ from P are the same. That's, that's the same as, as the number. That there is a very simple uh, uh, lemma of Elekesh uh, involving the number of distinct distances, uh, whose proof you don't have to read, but I copied it here so that you see that it's not a complicated thing. I wrote out every step of that. It's the Koshi Schwartz, Bunyakovsky uh, uh, inequality, uh, and uh, then it gives a lower bound. Simple lower bound uh, in terms of. M, M, and the number of distinct distances. Uh, and then, to wrap up the proof, the uh, number of incidences is essentially the same as Q. Now we have an upper bound for Q, we have a lower bound for Q. Uh, the, the lower bound is the bound as the upper bound is the incident bound. Again, there is a little triviality there because uh, of, of counting uh, uh, four tuples in which QI happens to be the same as QJ for capital. That get, gives a little error, and that's the 60 at which does it. And then if you compare these two bounds, then you get So that's in nutshell. So what we have proved, uh, uh, to repeat it, what we have proved now is that. Uh, uh, if you have an algebraic curve of between B and it doesn't contain a line circle and you take points of them, then the, the number of the distinct distances between the end points is So what does it say about the original problem in the internet? It says that if you know that a set of points has fewer than with a little so fewer than n distinct distances then it cannot contain uh, n to the three quarters uh, points that lie on an algebraic curve. Because if it contains n to the three quarters points, then already among those points, there are n distinct distances. So it says that in such a construction, there cannot be uh, a very heavy algebra. In fact, uh, it was uh, proved by Schaeffer, Zahl, and the third, uh, that uh, even the lines and the circles behave uh, in the same way, that they couldn't get uh, such a uh, good exponent, but they show that there is an axiom of that, that the, if the number of distinct distances is smaller than them, that there cannot be uh, a line that contains almost all points, or a circle that contains almost. Of course, the big question, about which I cannot see anything. You are invited to work. The other advantage, you should show that if the number of distinct distances is small, <coughs> that there must be a line or a circle or an algebraic curve on which there are relatively many. Like square, maybe there are square root of n points on a line. That would be the best, but instead of square root of n, prove n to the epsilon. For any epsilon. Well, that's Thank you very much. Any questions? I have a question. I'm curious about uh, your drawing. Uh, uh, you used to the circles in yes. R4. Uh, what is the total number of vertices in four space do you have there? Two circles and Well, if you, if you just look at one circle, even if the points uh, on that one circle are uh, are uh, they, they form a regular angle and there are just n distances uh, between that and also n distances here. Uh, and there is another So we have two two times ten vertices. Yeah, but we, we are not worried about the constants here because we know what they are. What is the number of unit distances and Oh, I see. So I shouldn't have said n squared divided by Well, I said that there are n half points here and n half points. And then the number of unit distances will be the same. Yeah, yeah. The number of unit distances will be n squared divided by 4. Because the, 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 the square root 2, I call a I, 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 I scale it. Mm, I normalize it, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I didn't make it. Yeah. Can you determine a value for CD in your theorem? 
Uh, well, uh, this is a good question again, because uh, if you can, then uh, so it, 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 it could be used to, uh, uh, for, for several reasons. So we have a bond which is not very bad. When I'm saying not very bad, it means that it is a polynomial of B. Uh, but we don't know the exact exponent of uh, B, and we are working on it uh, because uh, uh, by that we even could, uh, in principle, get uh, close to uh, an answer of uh, the discussion. More questions? If not, uh, thank you for the debate.